Marquis family. It's your brother, Mark Lamont Hill. Welcome to night school. We're officially here on the Mark Lamont Hill official YouTube channel. And welcome to night school. It is every night, Monday to Thursday here at 1030 p.m., where I talk to you about the biggest issues, the biggest stories, all the biggest things happening in the world. And unlike TV shows and all that kind of stuff, we give you an analysis. I try to make this more like a classroom than a TV show. That is to say, you're going to get a, an update, but you're going to get a breakdown. You're going to get an analysis and it's going to be conversations. And unlike other programs, it's also going to be question and answer. So welcome. Welcome to night school, y'all. So much I want to talk about tonight. And I want to get I want to get started right away because Lord knows there is so much stuff that we need to cover. I'm going to start with abortion rights because this is a story that I think is one of the most interesting, urgent, and dangerous stories that we've heard in a long time. Today, Monday, April 1st, the Florida Supreme Court ruled that abortion is not protected by the state constitution. This now clears the way for a six-week abortion ban to take effect within 30 days. Now, let's be clear. Abortion is still legal in Florida, and abortion has been legal in Florida with a 15-week window. But Ron DeSantis, the governor from Florida, who keeps pushing, uh, keeps advancing the most restrictive, the most retrograde, the most problematic uh, public policies we've seen in almost any state in decades, he's the, the gift that keeps on giving for right-wing Republicans because he has now said that that 15-week limit on abortions is now six weeks. Six weeks. Um, now, this is problematic for lots of reasons, right? I mean, we don't necessarily think that this reflects the will of the people. We'll find out. But six weeks in many ways becomes a ban on abortion. 15 weeks gives you an opportunity. 15 weeks gives you a chance. If you say, look, anything past 15 weeks you can't do. That's three months, almost four months. But six weeks? Do you know how many people, how many women don't know that they're uh, pregnant in week two, week three, week four, week five, week six? Do you know how many childbearing people find out that they're pregnant in week eight, week nine, week 10, week 12? You may not know, but they know. And that's why they do this ban. Republicans make the ban six weeks so that they can say, okay, we didn't ban abortion. We just don't want abortions that go too far. And they'll tell you these hyperbolic, dishonest stories about babies being born at or being aborted at like eight months, nine months, not telling you the full story, misrepresenting what's happening. Uh, they, they do this to take away women's reproductive freedom. The decision to abort or not abort a baby is a decision that a woman should be able to make with her family, specifically with her partner, with her doctor, and with, if she's a person of faith, with her community of faith, with her higher power. This should be the conversation. And I'm saying her because this primarily affects woman, women, <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, there are trans men who also have babies. Uh, they should have the same rights. We should be including them, as we say, childbearing people. This should all be part of the conversation. All of it should be part of the conversation. But they don't want it to be part of the conversation. But th there's another piece to this real quick, and that is uh, the ruling. Well, it's a really separate ruling. And separate ruling, the court also decided that Floridians would get a chance to vote to establish abortion in the state constitution in November. It needs a 60% yeah, 60 vote to pass, uh, and then that would guarantee the right to an abortion before viability. So one of the things we will see in November 
is just how viable, pardon the expression, this public policy is. Does this reflect the will of the people? Does this reflect the interests of the people or does it not? That'll be something to know. That'll be something to find out. All right. I want to talk now about another story that has been, I mean, Republicans lately have been wilding. That's all I could tell you. Republicans have been wilding. People all around the world have been outraged recently because of a Republican congressman who made a statement. I don't even, you know, sometimes I read stuff and I'll be like, is this the onion? You know what I'm saying? Is this, uh, is this, is this like uh, fake news? Is this like a caricature of, um, uh, of what's really happening? Because there's no way. There's no way a Republican could really believe this shit, right? Like, there's no way a Republican would really say this, right? There's there's no way a Republican would really do this. That's 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 the, that's the position that I often take, and the reason I take that position is because I find it somewhat implausible that these people could say such extraordinarily ridiculous and hurtful and painful and, and inhumane and even cruel things all the time. Anyway. I don't mean to give all this preamble. I'm just I'm just very frustrated by by the conversation. By the way, y'all, why y'all here a like uh while you're here live with me, hit the like button. Let them YouTube algorithms know y'all feeling what I'm talking about. Let them know that you're watched it, watching this and engaged because when you bring that energy in, uh it matters. All right, let's get back to it. The internet has been buzzing. In fact, the whole political world has been buzzing because a Republican congressman has called for genocide in Gaza. That's right. He has actually quite literally called for genocide in Gaza. This is an official portrait of the man in question. His name is Congressman Tim Wahlberg. Tim Wahlberg is a representative uh, in the House of Representatives, of course, the U.S. House of Representatives. This isn't some state level wingnut. This isn't local city council. This is your U.S. Congress. And Tim Wahlberg in the state of Michigan has called for genocide in Gaza. Gaza. It is one of the most disgusting and disturbing things that I have heard in a long time. Here's what the man said. He was expressing that he uh, uh, that the U.S. shouldn't give any more aid to Gaza. He said that the U.S. shouldn't be providing support to Gaza. And you can hear him on the audio. Now, I haven't been able to independently confirm the the source, so that's why I didn't. I'm not sharing it with you, but I'm going to read the quote, and he's responded and confirmed um, that he made a statement like this. He said it's an edited clip, so I, I don't want to debate back and forth about whether the clip is pristine. So I'm going to respond to what I know he said, and I'm going to respond to what he uh, to what he said as 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 a follow up. This man said. We should not be giving aid to Gaza. He said, and I quote, it should be like Nagasaki and Hiroshima. Get it over quick. Now, if y'all don't know history, you know, in the specifics of it, I know y'all probably heard Nagasaki and Hiroshima, but it's referring to the bombing of two cities in Japan using nuclear weapons in 1945. Uh, Hiroshima was bombed first, uh, August uh, 6th. Of, 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 of 1945, and then on August 9th, Nagasaki was bombed. Uh, you're not talking about a small scale bombing here. You're talking about 80,000 people, I believe, in the first bombing and 40,000 people in the second bombing. This was not a small thing. Hiroshima and Nagasaki is generally considered to be one of the most morally atrocious acts by any nation. It's the only time, the only time, I'm saying again, the only time that nuclear weapons have been used in war. You're talking about, and, and by the way, I'm just talking about direct killing when I said the 80 and the 40. That's not even counting the people who died from like uh, radon, radiation, excuse me. That's not counting um, the people who had long-term impacts. And let's be clear, I'm not just talking, when I say people, I mean civilians. I mean civilians. And so, yes, 
after an atomic bomb was dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, of course, there was a quick end to things. You killed everybody. But most of the people you killed, I mean, overwhelmingly so, most of the people you killed, most of the people you killed were what? Civilians. They were civilians. They were civilians. So when you look at the look at the devastation here of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, this is what a city looks like after you bomb it. Now, some of you might say that don't look that different than Gaza. Hmm. There's a reason for that. There is a reason for that. The reason, of course, is where there's a current devastation and a genocide in Gaza that the world doesn't want you to see. Well, this man absolutely advocated this. Now, to be clear, it's not just cruel to call for the bombing of Gaza. It's illegal. Much of what we've seen in Gaza in, since October uh, 7th, six months we're almost on, has been illegal. But now he's saying, don't even slow it, do it anymore. Don't slow walk it. Just kill everybody. Get it over quick. Now, he may not be calling for a nuclear weapon. I don't think he was calling for a nuclear weapon per se. But again, let's be clear. Israel has nuclear weapons. They say they don't got them. Or they don't say they don't have them. They won't confirm that they have them. And there is something called the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. We know who got them and who don't got them, allegedly. We know who's not supposed to have them. We know who's committed to not having them, but Israel doesn't care. And they don't. And Netanyahu doesn't pretend that he doesn't have them. He just won't affirm the question, but he does it in a way where you know he got it. You know Israel has it. And you can go to the Negev. You can go to the Nukab. You can go to the south of Israel uh, near Dimona, and you will see the, nu the nuclear plant. So Israel could do this. So that's why we can't take this lightly. It's not like telling you know, somebody who doesn't have the capacity or even someone who is in uranium enrichment stages. No, Israel could blow up Gaza like Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And so this is wildly irresponsible, but it reflects a certain kind of commitment that the right has to destroying Palestinian lives and expressing no care about it. We had another uh, a, a, a Republican, right, who said um, that there were no civilians. No innocence um, in Palestine, no innocence in Gaza. Uh, Brian Mast, uh, who said there's no innocent Palestinians. Can you imagine saying that? There's no innocent Palestinians. This is the same logic. Just blow them all up. Because that's what we did with Hiroshima and Nagasaki. If y'all don't know about this, look it up. Study the Manhattan Project. Study uh, the, the technology and the politics and how they all welded together to create a moment where... United States is responsible for killing hundreds of thousands of people, civilians. And we haven't done it since 1945. But this man's trying to bring it back. Well, Congressman Wahlberg, Tim Wahlberg, responded. I want to give uh, the congressman a chance to articulate his position. Here's what he said on Twitter. His full statement uh, on reporting of my comments on Gaza. Again, notice how they, they frame it, right? Here's a full statement on the reporting of my full comment. In other words, he's framing this as a question of how we report it as opposed to what he actually said. The man is, is, is being slick. But I'm going to tell you what he said anyway. He said, as a child who grew up in the Cold War era, the last thing I'd advocate for would be the use of nuclear weapons. In a shortened clip, I used a metaphor to convey the need for both Israel and Ukraine to win their wars as swiftly as possible without putting American troops in harm's way. My reasoning was the exact opposite of what's being reported. The quicker these wars end, the fewer innocent lives will be caught in the crossfire. The sooner Hamas and Russia surrender, the easier it will be to move forward. The use of this metaphor, along with the removal of context, distorted my message, but I fully stand by these beliefs and stand by our allies. So, so many things wrong with this, but first it's just complete BS, right? This is what you do when you say something and you get caught and you gotta try and square a circle. You gotta try and make it make sense without sounding like the monster that you were being when you made the claim. 
Um, the last thing I'd add, again, do I think he was advocating for nuclear weapons? No, I think he was advocating for genocide. I think he doesn't want a nuclear bomb to drop, but I do think he wants, he said, to win their wars as swiftly as possible. How do you win the war swiftly in a few days like Hiroshima and Nagasaki? Do Netanyahu's plan strike in Rafah, a, a huge widespread ground invasion that promises, according to everybody who's watching from diplomats throughout Europe to human rights organizations to military experts, they all say very clearly this is going to be a humanitarian disaster. They want to wipe people out. They want to push people into the Sinai. They want to basically empty up the Gaza Strip and allow it to be ethnically cleansed. And he didn't care how it happens. But this is the right wing position. This is the right wing argument. And this is why it's shameful. But that's what they do. And they don't want us to report it. When I say they, I'm talking about the right, the Republicans. I'm talking about the right um, in terms of not just whether you vote Republican or Democrat, but in terms of the certain kind of uh, political posture people are taking toward Palestine at this moment is a right wing position. One that's also shared by y'all homie, y'all friend. And I mean, the way black people mean it when they say it. Benjamin Netanyahu. So we got to talk about that in, in a certain way, too, because today was a today was a devastatingly sad day for uh, the world of journalism, uh, particularly international journalism, because uh, the Israeli parliament voted today 70 to 10 in favor of a law that grants the government permission to ban foreign news networks that they deem to be a threat to national security. Hmm. If they deem, if, if, if according to Israel, if they deem a network to be a threat to national security, they feel compelled, they feel empowered, and now it is legal to ban that network from Israel. Well, guess what? You might, because some of y'all are saying, well, why are you making it about a single network? Why are you making it about, um, why are you making it about Al Jazeera? Well, I work for Al Jazeera, so I ain't gonna lie, I have a, a vested interest in this. But I'm not just being selfish. This isn't like hit dog will holler syndrome where I'm assuming that they're talking about uh, Al Jazeera. Netanyahu has been very clear, has been very clear in saying, and I'm posting this right here for you so you can read for yourself. After the, the vote passed, he said the terrorist channel Al Jazeera will no longer uh, be, will no longer broadcast from Israel. I intend to act immediately in accordance with the new law to stop the channel's activities. Huh. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? First, Netanyahu saying he's going to comply with the law. The entire world has been outraged and disgusted by Benjamin Netanyahu's flagrant disregard of 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 israeli law that's why he's fighting so hard to stay in the prime minister uh chair because he knows once he leaves the chair he's probably going into a prison because he absolutely does not follow the law but th he follows the law that he wants to follow that, that we'll, we'll, we'll tell that story another time the point is netanyahu is saying that that they are going to now ban Al Jazeera. Why Al Jazeera? Well, we know the answer, the actual answer, right? The actual answer is that Al Jazeera, and not just Al Jazeera, again, full disclosure, I work for Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera is one of the, one of the uh, outlets that consistently tells the truth about what's happening in Israel and Palestine. Israel has been a thorn in the side, uh, oh, excuse me, uh, uh, Al Jazeera has been a thorn in the side of Israel forever. As long as there's been Al Jazeera, they have been a thorn in the side of Israel. Not just Israel, for those of you who are why they all ain't worried about Israel. They're not only worried about Israel. Have you watched Al Jazeera's coverage of 
Israel, uh, uh, Russia, Ukraine? Have you watched as the as the Egyptian government how they feel about how they feel about Al Jazeera? Ask the Rwandan government how they feel about Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera tells the truth. Al Jazeera uh, attempts to tell stories that otherwise don't get told. Doesn't mean Al Jazeera is perfect. There's plenty of credit to critique of Al Jazeera, and you should have a critique of Al Jazeera. I'm not asking you not to. I'm not. I'm not carrying the water for Al Jazeera. What I am saying though is, this is not about security. But for those of you that don't know, the Israeli government consistently, consistently uses the pretext of national security in order to engage in actions that preserve the Israeli ethno state. It's that simple. And so censoring Al Jazeera and other networks, Al Jazeera is not going to be the only network that gets censored, but Al Jazeera is one of the networks that's going to be censored. And look, if, you know, Al Jazeera responded by issuing a statement and what Al Jazeera said is Al Jazeera reiterates that such slanderous accusations uh, will not deter us, will not deter us from continuing our bold and professional coverage and reserves the right to pursue every legal step. And of course, Mohammed uh, Moad, who's the managing editor of Al Jazeera, said, uh, we are not in the business of pleasing everyone. I'm glad he said that. And that's journalism. We speak truth to power. He called this alarming and dangerous. So this is where we are right now. They are literally censoring the media. Now, this is for Israel. That doesn't mean that Al Jazeera won't be in Gaza. But Al Jazeera also faces an extraordinary charge in Gaza, because in Gaza, they're killing all of us. When I say us, I mean journalists, specifically Al Jazeera journalists. I have been sort of struck since the time I've worked here at Al Jazeera by how many how many of my colleagues have been killed. I don't think you understand what that means to work in a place where um, they just keep killing your colleagues, where they literally kill your colleagues. It's, I, I've never seen anything like it. I've, I've never experienced anything like it before. Um, and it's devastating. Think about Wael Dahdouh, who is the managing editor, uh, or the bureau chief, excuse me, out in, in, in Gaza. They haven't killed him yet, but they tried. But they killed his wife. They killed his son, Hamza. They killed his daughter. They killed many, many members of his family. Look at what they did to Shireen Abu Akhla before the Gaza war. I could name name after name after name after name after name, but when you start getting into the hundreds of people who have been killed, journalists who have been killed uh, in Israel, it, 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 all, it all lines up. Journalists get killed. Journalists get killed because they're telling the truth. And now they're saying, well, they're a security threat. Well, there's a way that that's true, right? Because if you continue to put a spotlight on Israel's flagrant contraventions of international law, if you continue to uh, make the world aware of this illegal occupation in this apartheid state, et cetera, and the siege in Gaza, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, then yes, it could force a reassessment of what Israel looks like so that we finally move toward a just solution for everybody. One state solution, maybe, but they would say one state solution compromises the security of the ethno state that they've created, which is technically true. We should make sure that no person is physically harmed. We should make sure that everyone is safe. But we should also make sure that everyone has justice because peace is the necessary precondition of justice. And until we get that, we ain't going to see nothing else. But I'll tell you more about this and we'll talk more about uh, what's going on in, in Palestine and specifically the Gaza Strip later tonight during my Gaza update, which will immediately follow night school. So, But I had to tell these two stories about this because they were, almost, they were bigger um, than just the Gaza update. This is part of our global news coverage. And so I want to make sure uh, that we got it. I got to talk about the GOP, man. I got to talk about the GOP. You know, I'm even going to say it's, it's not even just about trans rights, although they've been pissed about, about, about 
anything related to trans uh, siblings all week, all month, all whatever, right? But let's get beyond that for a moment. I, I, I want to make this a bigger conversation. The GOP has been outraged about Easter. As you all know, March 31st, 2024 was Easter Sunday. And the Republican Party has done all they could do. Some of their most prominent voices have done all they could do to make uh, the Democratic Party, to make the Biden administration in particular, look as if they are just godless, irreligious libertines running around trying to destroy the world. Look at some, look at these headlines. Look at these headlines that uh, right wing media have have uh, shared. Uh, here's uh, House Speaker Mike Johnson, just to give you the full context, posting on his Twitter page um, this headline: "Biden proclaims Easter Sunday Transgender Day of Visibility," and then Speaker Johnson says the Biden White House has betrayed the central tenet of Easter, which is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We could debate that, right? There are a lot of Christians out there who would say Resurrection Sunday is about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Easter is about Easter eggs and bunnies and all, and, and, and you know, for black folk, you know, fancy uh, church clothes and pastel colors, etc. Get your Easter suit up. You know what I'm saying? Two different things, but I'll leave that for a moment. Banning sacred truth and tradition while at the same time proclaiming Easter Sunday as Transgender Day is outrageous and abhorrent. The American people are taking note. Uh, he also posted this one. White House bans religious Easter eggs from art contest. So let, let's let's get at both of these, right? And I, and I, talk, I did a full video yesterday. It's on the channel on Caitlyn Jenner. So I'm going to not focus on Caitlyn Jenner, but too much. But Caitlyn Jenner was one of the people in addition to House Speaker Johnson, in addition to uh, Vivek Ramaswamy and others who came forward, who came public and said, how could Biden proclaim Easter Sunday to be transgender day? How dare he? And I'm going to tell you, like I told them yesterday, this is a fake outrage that is deeply, uh, deeply dishonest. That is deeply, deeply dishonest. When you look at, for example, Kate, again, Caitlyn Jenner's tweet here. Hey there, it's called Easter Sunday, the holiest day in the Christian faith that billions of people practice worldwide. As if, again, framing in response to Karen Jean-Pierre, the White House uh, press secretary, who again is talking about transgender day of visibility and that the Biden-Harris administration would be honoring that. But again, why is that a problem? Well, what the Republicans do masterfully, they, they're, they're brilliant at this, right, is they make you, they, they frame the argument in a way that makes it look like it's, to quote the great Marlo Stanfield, they make you think it's one way when in fact it's the other way. And let me be very specific about what I'm talking about. They make it seem as if President Biden, Joe Biden, somehow made a decision to change Easter, that Joe Biden decided, or excuse me, to change the, the transgender day of visibility. So if they came to Joe Biden and said, we need a day for trans people. And Joe Biden said, well, you know what? If you're going to need a day for trans people, I got a day for you. Why don't you pick Easter? I mean, this is literally what Vivek Ramaswamy argued. This is literally uh, what the claim that's being made um, by the Republicans, right? Is it why did Joe Biden? Why is it? Why do you have to make it March thirty first? So I'm gonna show y'all. I'm gonna show y'all something. Here's a chart for those of y'all that care about charts and facts and data and evidence. And I know that ain't a whole lot of Republicans out there, but I'm gonna show it anyway. I'm gonna show you this chart. You can see from the year 1800 through here. You can see the date that Easter falls because, as you know, Easter isn't the same day every year. Just like Ramadan and Eid are not the same day every year. They're based on different calendars. So when you look at when you when you look at March 30 31st here, Easter falls on March 31st in 2024. Last year it was on April 9th. Next year it'll be on April 20th. It varies widely and wildly. Joe Biden has nothing to do when Easter falls. Right? You say okay, well he can't get that's not the point, Mark. 
The point is he could control when transgender date falls. He didn't have to put it on March 31st. That's the point. The international, first of all, it's the international tr day of trans uh, gender visibility. What does that mean? It's international. Joe Biden is not the king of the world. The U.S. acts like we we we're the, we run the whole world, but Joe Biden is not the emperor of the world. It's an international day. It didn't start in the U.S. or or it's not exclusive to the U.S. Number one. Number two, it's been on March thirty first for fifteen years. Two thousand nine, the Obama administration. Two thousand sixteen, the Trump administration. Two thousand twenty. The Trump administration, excuse me, 2009 is when it started. The Obama administration, 2016, the Trump administration, 2020, the Biden administration. So three presidents have all seen this happen. So no, Joe Biden didn't declare the 31st to be trans day. It already was. And he didn't have anything to do with Easter either. People say, oh, my God, but they're desecrating the day. They know what they're doing. Nah, again, you can see from this chart. You can see from this chart. You know, when the next time Easter and trans visibility, they're going to fall on the same on, 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 on the same day. I'm going to show you just so y'all don't think that I'm crazy. The next time March, the next time it falls on March 31st will be, let's see, 2086, which means everybody in this conversation will be dead the next time trans visibility day happens on Easter Sunday again, or the Easter Sunday falls on trans visibility day. Now, for people like Caitlyn Jenner, I'm like, why are you so outraged by this? Why is being trans so incompatible with your holy day? You are a trans woman. You say being trans is natural and normal and right, and you feel good about it. I agree with you. Sincerely, I do. Live your life. But if you think that that's incompatible with your Christian faith or incompatible with that which is good or that which is holy or that which is pure, then why the hell are you trans? Or why the hell are you Christian? How do you how do you square them circles? How do you uh, rock out with those perspectives? That's the question for you, Caleb. But for the rest of the Republican Party, it makes sense. They hate trans people and they don't pretend not to hate trans people. So it completely makes sense, sadly, that they would take this position. But he didn't just use Easter to, to, to beat up on trans people. They also used Easter to talk about the Easter egg hunt. Oh, my God, you ain't seen angry. You ain't seen angry till you see a Republican get mad about some damn Easter eggs. Oh, my God, the White House banned religious Easter eggs from the art contest. Now, again, is it true? This is what Republicans do. They take something and they lightly dip it in truth. They lightly dip it in truth. So... There's an Easter egg hunt. There's an Easter egg hunt at the White House. And at the Easter egg hunt at the White House, they send you uh, some guidelines. They send you guidelines. Here's the guidelines. I'm showing them to you right now. Celebrating National Guard families. Easter egg traditions at the White House. As you see, the Easter eggs and the egg roll party goes back a long way. First Lady Jill Biden is at the, the helm of it. They say here, children, y'all can't see that. Hold on, let me, let me make it a little bit clearer for you. And actually, let me. Children should depict an egg template A snapshot of their life, a snapshot of their life, a favorite activity, scenery in your state, your military family, a day in your life, right? They want kids to make nice, friendly, feel good art. Is a lot of it some job campaign stuff? Of course it is. Of course it is. No one disagrees with that. But here's what they say. 
Here are the restrictions. Submission sh must not in any way disparage the sponsor. Submission must not contain material that is inappropriate, indecent, obscene, liable, blah, 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 right? Submission should not can must not contain material that promotes bigotry, racism, hatred, blah, blah, blah. Submission must not contain material that's unlawful. But here's the one that got them all riled up. because they're, they're good with all that, right? Here's what got them all riled up. Submission must not include any questionable content. Religious symbols, overtly religious themes, or partisan political statements. Again, the submission, sorry, my computer's not letting me be great, but the submission must not include any questionable con content, religious symbols, overtly religious themes, or partisan political statements, right? And that's what's pissing all the Republicans off. They're like, wait a minute. Wait a minute. They're saying no religious themes on Easter. So again, a couple things about this, right? First, they lightly dip it in truth. Yes, they say no religious symbols. What they're saying is if you're at the White House and all these kids are, are doing their Easter egg thing, one, is Easter is not a religious thing, not the Easter egg part of it. The resurrection and crucifixion part, yes, Good Friday, Resurrection Sunday, Palm Sunday, all that absolutely re religious, absolutely rooted in Christian faith. But when you have kids dress up like bunnies and eat Cadbury eggs and and hide, you know, eggs in the, the all of that stuff, all of that stuff, that ain't religious. But also the point of the provision here or the point of the restriction is, is so that people won't come in there with offensive stuff they want this to be a warm and fuzzy moment now you might say i don't agree with that easter is supposed to be about jesus just like christmas is supposed to be about jesus even if it hasn't been that and we don't want to lose our religious connection to these holidays okay fine i, I think you have an argument to be that can be made although i would argue maybe the white house shouldn't be the place where you would articulate that but whatever cool i'm not mad at you here's the issue though Here's the problem, though. The lightly dipped in truth part is also that you're saying that this is because of the United, that this is because of the Biden administration, that the Biden administration has banned Easter eggs or banned religion from 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 the White House or banned religion from Easter. Like, knock it off. Knock it off. That is the part that is not true. And again, I don't even like defending. I hate defending the Biden administration because I generally disagree with them. But truth is truth, and what is right is what is right. I, I am connected to the facts. Nothing more. Nothing more. So the American Egg Board, which is the group that, and I hate saying their name because it sounds so ridiculous, but the American Egg Board, the group that actually promotes this, says something different all right and i'm reading this straight from from the news outlet nbc news actually posted this emily metz the president and ceo of the american egg board says uh, the american egg board has been a supporter of the white house easter egg roll for over 45 years and the guideline language referenced in recent news reports has been consistently applied to the board since its founding in other words every single presidential administration has had the same rules every single presidential administration has said you can't have crazy religious imagery and stuff on your eggs so why are we pretending that it's just the biden administration well because it's politics as usual right they want to frame it as joe biden hates religion Joe Biden is a fake Catholic. Joe Biden doesn't care about Christians. Joe Biden wants to take your holidays and replace them with trans people and 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 Jesusless Easter. And here's the crazy part: they're trying to tell you this while advancing the pre the candidacy um, of Donald Trump, who may be the least religious president we've ever seen. You can't name a Bible verse. Doesn't go to church. They don't give a damn about Christianity. Christianity, they just want power. The Republicans do. 
They're literally talking about dropping bombs. They're literally sending money to kill more people around the world on this so-called holy religious day. Trump is, if, if God is upset that the Easter bunny uh, can't be carrying religious eggs in his basket at the White House, how does he feel about Donald Trump selling Bibles for $60? How does he feel about, uh, or she feel, or they feel, however you imagine God? How, how, how do, how does your higher power respond or feel about global imperialism and poverty? Homelessness. How do, how do you reconcile that stuff? But y'all think God is mad about this? It doesn't matter. It actually doesn't matter because they don't care about what makes sense intellectually. They don't have to square the circles. They don't have to reconcile contradictions. All they have to do is convince you that Joe Biden doesn't care about the working guy, the working woman. Joe Biden doesn't care about the religious guy, the religious woman. Joe Biden hates Jesus and in, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Donald Trump will save you, even though Donald Trump is the one who's the one percent or the billionaire. Donald allegedly, Donald Trump is the one who um, is disconnected from everyday life. Donald Trump is the one who actually hates religion and faith. This is the the contradiction. This is how fascism works, though. So the GOP outcry over Easter is part of a bigger uh, manipulation that they're engaged in to convince you that only they can save you from these crazy liberals. It's crazy. It's wild. But it's 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 where we are right now. As Obama used to say, it's silly season. And as we go into 2024, you're going to see a lot more of it. All right, y'all. We're going to take a quick break, one minute. And uh, when we come back on the other side, we are going to talk about entertainment. We're going to talk about some stories with the Neptunes. We're going to talk about the, the, the latest Diddy update. Uh, and we got a uh, a comment that's not entertainment, but it's something interesting with our dear brother, uh, Dr. Umar Johnson. So we will talk about all of that after we take this quick break. This quick break. Be right back. Right, you do it. You make her happy, so you'll be all right. Yeah. And and happy wife normally is about happy life for me. Right, that's what not I'm saying. It ain't about her. It's about you. Yeah. So Van says that because Jewish people showed up for Black Americans during the civil rights era, he now feels compelled to stand with them now. Let me be what, clear. What's yeah. the white liberal ideology I'm following? I'm Lamont. not saying you. Lamont. No, that's what you said. Like so I'm saying which one? No white. one is free until we are all free. There is no room for any injustice. All right, family, we are back at night school, and I got a couple other stories that I just have to talk to y'all about because. So much stuff is interesting here. So much stuff, honestly, be cracking me up. And I don't want y'all to be <laughs> to be left out of the conversations that I be having with my people or that I have with myself because they'd be funny. All right. So uh, earlier today, uh, Dr. Umar uh, responded to this post that came up. As you know, in case you don't know, Dr. Umar Johnson is one of the more uh, visible, uh, well-regarded uh, well-known, popular, uh, also infamous challenge. Some people love him, some people hate him. People have strong feelings about our dear brother. But either way, people know who Dr. Umar is. He's a meme, he's a gif, he's a speaker, he's a builder, he's all these things, right? Uh, and about maybe a few months ago, he was tied to uh, Sukihana. And people said that they were going to date. Dr. Umar seemed to enjoy... Uh, the conversations about that. He even made a couple lives about it, you know, talking about Suki Papa, uh, which I, I got a kick out of. Um, we've seen Dr. Umar in the news before about these kinds of things. I think uh, a year ago, more than a year ago, he married two women on his Instagram. He announced that he was getting married to two women. I think he was just joking. It was tongue in cheek, maybe, or maybe he married one of them, or maybe he didn't. I don't believe he's married. I, I know he identifies as single. Uh, I don't care about his personal life. What I care about is the fact and it's none of my business, Dr. Umar's personal life. It's none of any of our business. I'm not here to talk about his personal life. What I'm here to talk about is the fact that this meme was going around saying that he had married Sukiana. Well, Dr. Umar took to Twitter to post this response. He said, y'all never let the, the truth get in the way of a good story. I guess she and I both missed our own wedding. So it's not true that Dr. Umar married Sukiana. The thing that's interesting to me about this story 
is um and here's the video for that i apologize that y'all didn't see it my 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 video wasn't videoing but as you see uh dr umar corrects the video right now that is him with sukiana right clearly they cool the rest not my business don't know don't care but what's interesting is again how quickly the internet will make a story up about people and i saw these images i saw people speaking about it matter of factly like it was true i saw people uh talking about dr umar and sukiana as if they had gotten married and the question is why first of all i'll be like who is the person who is the person that decides they're just going to make up a story about somebody because somebody 90 percent of people telling the story obviously don't know any better because they they saw a meme and believe it right that that comes to our critical media literacy we don't know how as a community of people or as a as a nation of people to um to consume media and to consume information in a way where we can dissect contradictions or we can examine the power dynamics and the power relationships we don't do any of that we don't do any of that we just accept it because it's in a box we accept it because it's in a chart we accept it because there's a guy at a desk with a tie on telling it to us so there's that piece of it right but what about the people that actually made the shit up what about the person who just decides you know what because some of y'all are out here some of y'all might even be on this chat right now right I, I got Sofia Martinez here saying I mean folks were convinced Jamie Foxx was a clone that's what I'm talking about Nicole Davis said people love to lie right that's what I'm talking about it's like some of y'all just make stuff up just to make stuff up So family, when you're out there, take it from Dr. Umar, take it from me, probably take it from Sukiyana too. Don't believe something just because there's an image, just because there's a chart, just because there's a meme, just because somebody even who's somewhat prominent tells it to you. Because sometimes these media outlets will seem established. They may, even, they may even have a lot of viewers, a lot of supporters. Doesn't mean they're telling the truth. So keep that in mind. Anyway, I want to move on to another story, but I had to tell that to y'all. Um, here's the story that. I think is very interesting, very surprising. Um, uh, I don't even know. How, I got to tell you, my experience in the music business, and not in the sense of my my experience following the music business, is that um, is that if if you stay with any group long enough, if you follow any crew long enough or if any crew themselves stay together long enough, there's going to be beef. There's going to be tension. There's going to be fissures. There's going to be stress. I was shocked today. Let's say that again. I was shocked today to see the news reports that announced that the Neptunes, Pharrell and Chad, of all people, had beef of all the people in the world who I would have thought would be the exceptions to the rule about groups beefing about the long if you work with somebody long enough they're going to split up and there's going to be tension you know there was like LA Reid and Babyface I don't think they ever had beef they just kind of went their separate ways you know Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis still holding it down for each other if, if they had a beef we never found out about it I love and respect that we shouldn't need to know about that but when I heard the story and i saw this at billboard magazine was reporting this a billboard news was reporting this right that pharrell williams and chad hugo are locked in a legal dispute over the naming rights of the neptunes i was honestly and legitimately shocked genuinely so again it takes a lot to shock me in this business but when i heard this i was i was struck because these two have been friends uh for decades they've been making hits since the 2000s and a lot of time now all of a sudden, um, when y'all hear uh, when y'all hear uh, the production sound of the Neptunes, y'all just say, "Oh, that's Pharrell," right? Or y'all talk about the greatest producers, y'all say Pharrell. But I mean, when you go back to the '90s, it was the Neptunes, the Neptune sound. When you hear "Give It to Me," Jay Z, 
that's the Neptunes. When you hear uh, Holla Back Girl, if you're into pop music, Gwen Stefani, by the way, I'm a big No Doubt fan. When you hear uh, Gwen Stefani's Holla Back Girl, that's Neptunes. When you hear Rocky Body, Justin Timberlake, that's the Neptunes. Snoop Dogg, Drop It Like It's Hot, that's Neptunes. N- Nelly, Neptunes are one of, my, one of my favorites that doesn't get the love that other songs do. If I Could Be Your Girl, Maya, Beanie Man and Maya, that's Neptunes. So the idea that the Neptunes is just Pharrell is not true. But some of y'all have gotten to that point where, you know what I mean? Because, you know, we, we prisoners of the moment. We start to think it's the, the, the Neptune sound is just uh, is just Pharrell, right? And Pharrell is dope and got his own thing and does his own thing. And he's brilliant and talented. But so is Chad Hugo. And we don't want to lose that. But the, the point is, is that those two are in a beef because uh, Chad Hugo accused Pharrell Williams of fraudulently seeking control over the trademarks according to billboard uh and there's a quote here from chad's attorney he said throughout their over 30 year history hugo and williams agreed to and in fact have divided all assets by ignoring and excluding chad or hugo from any and all applications filed by applicant for the mark the neptunes the applicant has committed fraud has committed fraud in securing the trademarks and acted in bad faith. And basically what happened was they went to a federal tribunal last week um, and Chad's attorney said that Pharrell Williams and his company uh, tried to unilaterally, that is to say by themselves, without any input from Chad, register trademarks for the Neptune's name. And basically Chad is saying, look, you can't, um, you can't, submit for a trademark in the name of our company in the name of our brand if my name ain't in it if you're not involving me too now pharrell responded and said um again i don't know the answer but pharrell's people said Pharrell's lawyer said, Pharrell is surprised by this. We have reached out on multiple occasions to share in the ownership and administration of this trademark and will continue to make that offer. The goal here was to make sure a third party doesn't get a hold of the trademark and to guarantee Chad and Pharrell share in ownership and administration. Now, he's, that seems unlikely to me. If there's that tight, I'm not saying Pharrell's lying, I'm not saying Chad's lying. What I'm saying is, is that something's missing here. Because if, if they're saying, look, we reached out and he just never responded. If y'all are tight and y'all have built a company together and y'all are the freaking Neptunes and, it, and and you tried to to own and administer the name and the trademark of the Neptunes, Pharrell, and you just keep calling Chad, he, no one ever responds. Like a lawyer just, you just leave you on red. The voicemails ain't picking up. Something's missing from this information. Either Pharrell's people aren't telling the truth and Chad hasn't been contacted or for else people are telling the truth and Chad's people haven't responded. But if Chad's people haven't responded, the question is why, right? And for us, for us statement, his people's statement that they made on his behalf was responded to. Here's what Chad's lawyer said. He said, if Pharrell's intent was to include Chad in the filing, he should have registered it in the name of their jointly owned company, Neptunes LLC, and not in his own name. Again, interesting point. He said this was a land grab in a long simmering dispute that has yet to be resolved. I'm going to read that again. Two parts of it. First, right? He basically said if Chad, if Pharrell was trying to do something with them together, then why did he why did he not put it in the Neptune's name and their joint company name and not in his single name? It's a hell of a question that Pharrell's going to have to answer. But here's the part that I'm going to read verbatim. He said this was a land grab in a long simmering dispute that has yet to be resolved resolved so pharrell's team is saying oh it's all good they're we're all fam you know we're all in the same place we just it was just a miscommunication and chad's people are saying nah bro nah bro this ain't a miscommunication this is a land land grab is a lot you're talking about like stealing indigenous rights you're talking about what we what the pil not we what the pilgrims did in in the in in, you know to the to the native americans you're talking about some in Tense stuff when you say it's just a land grab. And they say it's been a long and simmering dispute. That means that it's been going on for an extended period of time and that it's not like, I mean, neither of them is the violent type, I don't think. So it's not going to get the guns or even blows. They're not going to fight each other, but it's simmering. 
this is frustrating, man. The Neptunes are one of the greatest production duos we've ever seen. In fact, the greatest production duo we've ever seen in hip hop. So they better get this thing together. You know, we got to figure this thing out. Nicole says skateboard. She said B is P, Pharrell, right? Skateboard P be tripping sometimes. Again, I don't know who's right and who's wrong, but I do know that when things don't add up, it's because some information is missing. And I'd be curious to know what that information is uh, because it seems to be vital. All right, before we go, I got one more story. I got one more story. Um, I got to pull up my notes here. Um, pull up my notes here while we do this. Um, actually, y'all, I'm going to take one more quick break, literally 10 seconds, just so I can uh, reset and, and, and get pull my notes up, all right? Uh, just hold on 10 seconds, y'all. We'll be right back. All right, family. It is time for, once again, another Diddy update. That's right. We cannot have a day... At least it seems like we can't have a day anymore where we don't have a Diddy update. I got this light in my eyes, too. All right, y'all. Let me uh, let me pull this thing up because I need y'all to see this. I need, I, I need y'all to see what I'm about to show y'all because this is wild. All right? All right, family. <clears throat> All right, family, we wouldn't be, uh, I'm sorry, y'all, I'm having a little audio reverb. Y'all hear that? All right, let me try one more time. All right, family, the day wouldn't be complete without yet another Diddy update. It seems that every single day there is a story connected to Sean P. Diddy Combs, Sean Puff Daddy Combs, Sean Love, Brother Love Combs. We've had a story on him every single day, it almost seems like, in the, in the 2024 year. And certainly since his uh, lawsuit, his civil suit against that Cassie uh, filed against him came out, there has been a nonstop onslaught of people who have come out and accused Diddy of something. Some people have come back from the 90s and 2000s accusing him of various types of harassment or assault. Others are simply gossiping and telling rumors from the from the old days and the new days. Then you got folk like Lil Rod, the producer who's accusing him actively of not only uh, sort of taking money from him or, or cheating him out of money for production for the Love album, for his, you know, his most recent album, um, but also accusing him of sexual harassment and sexual assault. So there's a range and a gamut of things that have happened with Diddy. And most recently, of course, we know that Diddy's homes were raided in Florida and Miami. Uh, his sons uh, were there. They were placed in handcuffs uh, uh, briefly. And it's been a spectacle. And it's also been an open question as to what Diddy is being investigated for. Although human trafficking, uh, sex with underage people, drugs, guns, these are all things that have been in the mix. Well, today, or, or recently, I'll say, uh, another bit of information has come out. I'll be sure who is the R&B singer. Y'all know r you know R&B legend, Al B. Shore. He's also the biological uh, son of uh, of Diddy's stepson, Quincy. Um, of course, Al B. Shore had Quincy uh, with uh, Kim Porter, Diddy's ex who passed away. Well, Al B. Shore, if you don't know, was in a coma in the year 2022. Now, there have been a lot of rumors about how Al B. Shore got into a coma. Similarly, there have been many rumors about Kim Porter's death. Some people months ago, years ago, accused Diddy of being uh, responsible or connected to Kim Porter's sudden and mysterious death. I'm not saying he is. I'm simply saying that other people have accused him of that. And people have also accused him of being somehow involved in Al B. Shore's coma, saying that, you know, that was equally mysterious and dangerous. Well, again, I don't know what's true and what's not true. I'm not going to assume that Diddy is responsible just because people say he is. I have no idea what's true and what's not true. Y'all not going to sue me. And I honestly don't know the answer. But what I do know is a growing chorus of people are weighing in on Diddy being capable of that. The rumors and the allegations that he blew up Kid Cudi's car didn't help. The rumors and allegations of him being violent with Cassie and violent with Kim Porter didn't help. The, uh, the rumors that many people have said that he's physically violent with a lot of people didn't help. 
the commentaries, the constant commentaries from his uh, former bodyguard, Gene Deal, which you can see on the internet, didn't help. All of this is in the mix, but now Al B. Shore himself spoke up and he had something to say. He himself had something to say about the allegations. No one saw this coming, but it was important for him to say it, I guess. So here's what he said. This is courtesy of TMZ. We are going to be producing the Al B. Shore life story. So hold on to your, hold on to your bridges and you'll really understand how I ended up in a coma. You're really going to need to call Homeland Security. Did y'all hear that? If you Listen it, tomorrow. If you missed it, I'm going to say that. I'm not going to play for you again. What I am going to do, what I am going to do is say, excuse me, if you missed that, I'm, I'm going to just repeat it for you. He said, uh, the I'll be short story is coming out, right? Then he says, you're going to find out how I ended up in a coma. And he says, and here's the interesting part, the important part. You, you're really going to need Homeland Security. You're really going to need Homeland Security. That's a hell of a statement to make, right? You're going to need to call Homeland Security. Why is he saying that? Well, because if you remember when Diddy's homes were raided in Florida and Miami, who did who who at least helped coordinate it? Homeland Security. So he's invoking Homeland Security. He's mentioning Homeland Security. So he's clearly saying, look, he's at least implying that his coma was connected to Diddy. Now, again, I don't know, but he said, we're going to be producing the I'll Be Sure Life story. So hold on to your britches and you'll really understand how I ended up in a coma. You're really going to need to call Homeland Security. Now, this isn't the first time, this isn't the first time that I'll be sure has said or done something that would lead you to believe that would lead you to believe that um, that he was accusing Diddy of at least being funny style. They was at least accusing Diddy of doing something suspicious. And for, if you don't know, uh, I'm about to show you a, a picture of, of, of I'll be sure in the coma. Uh, if you if you can't take it, look away or, or, or for 20 seconds. But this is I'll be sure. This is I'll be sure. Now, that was him in a coma. Again, I'll be sure was healthy. Then all of a sudden, he wasn't. All of a sudden, he's in a coma. All of a sudden, he didn't look very good even after he got out of the coma. I mean, he was, I, it was great to hear him sound and look as good as he did, but that wasn't how he sounded and looked before. The question is what happened, right? How did he end up here? Well, he gave an indication, right? He tweeted at one point, now he deleted the tweet, but at some point he talked about him being okay and Kim being okay, and then something strange happened. That's what he himself said. He deleted the tweet. Now, did he delete the tweet because he didn't want no smoke? Probably. Makes sense. But that wasn't the only thing I'll be sure did. Because we're going to tell the I'll be sure story. We got to tell the whole I'll be sure story. Because I also thought that I'll be sure did something that was quite strange. Um, I'll be sure after the the homeland security raid at diddy's house after um the kids were handcuffed and quincy wasn't there by the way quincy was not there for that quincy was um i don't know where quincy was he was traveling he was flying as a matter of fact i do know where he was because he, he told us 
Um, but after that, I'll be sure posted something to Instagram. He wrote this. Again, Hollywood is such a strange place. He said, he posted a picture of himself and Quincy and he said, come home. The door is wide open. You're safe here, son. I love you, Pops. You're biological. Now, this is fascinating shit, man. First of all, Quincy's like 32. So this idea of come home, you're safe is weird, right? Second, Diddy raised that boy. Whatever you think of Diddy, whatever you think of I'll be sure, whatever you think of any of these people, Diddy was his, the father that Quincy knew. I'll be sure I had very little to do with the raising of his son, Quincy. It's not my business how, not my business why. I don't pretend to know the answers. I don't want to get in this man's business. But what's interesting is at 32, why you're saying you're safe here, son, come home as if he's like 12, right? Also, um, when you send public statements like this, you invite questions about why you couldn't call him. Why you couldn't text them? Why you couldn't reach out to them? Why do you need? Why do you need to do it on Instagram? What are you hoping to communicate? And if things are that estranged, what role do you play in that? You know, people say, why post that on the internet where you could just text them? Maybe we shouldn't assume, Sasha, that he can. Now, Sasha's saying it's to go re be relevant on social media. I think you're right. I think there is probably some of that playing out, but maybe Quincy doesn't talk to him. Maybe he doesn't have Quincy's phone number. Maybe he doesn't have a connection to him. But again, if that's the case, we got to get into some of the whys here. It's only right. Anyway, y'all, the Diddy story is going to continue to unfold. The Diddy story ain't going nowhere. And unfortunately, every single day, there's going to be more information uh, that's going to get us to this place that we got to figure out. Anyway, that's it for night school. We out of time, uh, but I wanted to at least uh, give y'all the updates on all the stories. We'll be back up with our Gaza update in about at uh, eleven forty-five. In about a few minutes, we'll be up with our Gaza update, uh, which will be brief but important. So make sure you, you check that out right here on the Marco Mahilla official YouTube channel. Also, this is April first; it's the beginning of the month, and we are ramping up for a incredible month of night school the first full month where the program will be airing every single night monday to thursday at 10 30 p.m right here on youtube uh we're building we're building staff we're building studio we're building content but to do that we need your help so one way you can help is by hitting the like button when you hit the like button you know when you come on and you watch the videos you look at the ads which you know gets content makers you know their their revenue streams that's all love that's all good but also hit the like button so we can extend the reach also share the content every clip that comes out every video that comes out before you go live tell other people or to watch us live make sure you let other people know hey night school something you need to watch share the love hit the subscribe button if you haven't hit the subscribe button please do so now and also hit that little bell for the notifications if you're so inclined also hit the join button there are so many people out there who come here and who watch it they haven't subscribed yet i want you to do that and then if you subscribe there's so many people also who haven't joined by joining you ensure the financial stability of the channel that means when you go to the you hit you go to the screens especially if you're on a desktop computer and you hit join you can also follow me on social media where i've put out uh, links and cues for all this stuff but if you hit the join button you allow us to have a monthly base of revenue that allows us to build more content to expand our studio to pay staff to pay all of our bills. This is what we're here for. It's the first of the month. So we're gearing up again for a big month of content, but we can do it better. We can only do it, in fact, with your help and with your support. So if you can, please hit the join button. If you've already joined, please consider gifting a membership for other people. We've seen that happen. Uh, right tonight, Meg, oh my God, thank you so much. Meg just gifted five memberships to people. India just gifted five memberships to people that means it's at least 10 of y'all out there right now can grab a membership for the month and be part of the channel be part of the family talim khan just gifted a membership to somebody thank you so much nicole watkins thank you so much for the sticker riza riaz excuse me wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh shukran jazilan thank you so much and thank you for joining the channel becoming a member courtney robinson thank you so much for joining the channel becoming a member 
Uh, Obrienum97, thank you so much for joining and becoming a member. Shell Rock, thank you so much for becoming a member. We appreciate you so much. Maria Piper, we appreciate you more than you could ever imagine. Infinite satisfaction in the building. You know I know who you are, my brother. Thank you so much. Send you salams. And uh, Sankofa Face Yoga Rashamela Kumbo, thank you so much for joining the channel. Yo, this is so beautiful. So much love here. So much uh, 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 commitment to helping build an independent media space, and we are grateful for it. Tonya Francesca, thank you so much. You know, the only other thing I say is for everybody out there watching right now, if you want to support the channel, you can also go right here to Cash App and just send something through. No long term commitments, no monthly, yearly, bi weekly, whatever commitments. Just go to Cash App and drop something in right now with the number of people watching. We could pay for a week a whole week of content if everybody watching right now just sent five dollars if everybody who's watching right now live just went to the cash app or watching it later on vod if you whenever if you're watching this if you just go to cash app and send five dollars we would be well on our way to making a down another payment on our studio we'd be a, a little bit more on our way to paying for our production team we'd be a little bit more on our way for getting an editor to edit these videos so we can not just do the live stuff, but also produce regular content, shorts, doc, mini docs, et cetera. We can do all of that only with your support. So please hit the join button. But also if, if everybody watching here could send $5 to MLH TV, we could do it. And again, if you don't have that, you can send less. If you don't have anything, that's okay. Just hit the like button. Just hit the subscribe button. Doesn't cost you anything. We need the love. We live off your love and support and we appreciate y'all so much. So I wanna thank y'all for watching. Uh, and I will talk to y'all soon. Peace.